So uh, does anybody know who the next presenter is? No? No. All right, I guess I'll do it. That's fine. Okay, so y'all pretty much have known me here for the last couple of days. My name is Alex Goulis. I am the CEO of Office Ring. Um, I'm really ridiculously crazy about open SIPs and all that jazz, but today I'm going to be talking to you about something that we do use open SIPs for. It's localizing services on a global scale. So one of the big buzzwords the last few years, you still can't hear me? No? Serious mode now. So what about now? Can you hear me better? Okay. So one of the biggest buzzwords, you know, in the VoIP community lately, especially in the realm of HA, is AnyCast. And AnyCast is probably a groundbreaking protocol for us here because all of the HA stuff that we've seen, Pete Kelly actually had a really great presentation showing us like the evolution of some of the stuff we've gone through to maintain HA in the past. But AnyCast pretty much takes care of that for us. One of the biggest things that we don't think about when we start deploying things with AnyCast is where, if we're going to make this really big global network, how are we going to service customers in different areas that might at different times have different routes to different parts of our network? I just wanted to make sure everyone was waking up. There really was a lack of cat pictures in this, uh, in this year's discussions. Very sadly disappointed with Mike Mavrudis back there. He's good for a cat or two. So I gave you a little bit of my experience. Um, also, I've been designing multi-tenant systems, VoIP platforms since 2009. Um, I used to be the lead developer of Raytel's virtual PBX systems, and now I'm sharing that with Mr. Gutman, the CTO of Voice Center, um, in our joint effort of Office Ring. Um, what a lot of people don't know is I'm actually the first certified Open SIPs professional. I know that is. It's the secret sauce, or at least one of the ingredients. Um, maybe the only one. Um, and as you can see, I'm ridiculously addicted to everything Open Sips, especially the community. You all don't know this. I'm sure you feel it, but I love every one of you in a very platonic way. All right, so I know most of you know some of this. Maybe some of you don't. Let's just be sure. Um, for those of you that don't, you're a little behind the, the times. We're going to try and get you up there with a little bit of information. So what AnyCast basically does is it allows us to take the, a single IP and distribute it across many machines, globally, um, locally within a data center. It also gives us some really nice caveats. It balances traffic for us. It makes the edge highly available. Um, and it actually gives us something called latency-based routing, where resources are supposed to be pointed to the closest IP, to the closest endpoint. I stole this from Razvan. This will kind of give you an idea of like what AnyCast does. All these nodes know everything about each other and everything about the devices that are attached to them. Um, we've got a guy over here somewhere in Las Vegas probably. And uh, he's making requests and he's going to be routed to the closest nodes. It makes complete sense, mostly in RTP, maybe not necessarily on the signaling side. And we also use an ancient protocol at this point called BGP. It is the most important routing protocol on the internet. Um, and effectively what it does is it maintains prefixes in all of the core routers of the internet for your IP addresses. Um, the unfortunate side is you need to own or rent a slash 24. And with the amount of IP4, IPv4 addresses that are left in the world, that's getting more expensive by the minute. Um, I think the last going price was for an Afrinic um, slash 24, and I think it was pricing somewhere around $5,000. Um, but the really great thing about this, obviously, is that 
your IPs, the routes to your IPs are saved in these core routers throughout the internet. And you're just not another IP on the, on the internet where endpoints are getting routed through anywhere to get to you. Um, it does establish, you know, pretty good stability of your routes. It also gives you the ability to change the routes based on your needs. So just to kind of give you a visualization of some of the core routers on the internet, um, your slash 24 is stored basically in every one of these. And does anyone know why it's a minimum of slash 24? I figured I'd do a question, David. I already know you know. How about somebody back here? Give it to us. Did everybody get that? Was that the Archie working word? Most of it. Okay, no, 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 throw it at him. <laughs> By the way, I forgot to uh, announce my co-host for this, for this 25 minute presentation that we didn't get a timer to start. Wow, Giovanni, you had one job. <laughs> um, so he did answer most of it. One of the other things is that the routers on the internet don't have enough memory to do this. They are physically blocked by being able to do this as well. There's just not enough footprint for it. But he's right on everything else. It's just a big damn mess if we go beyond the slash 24. So let's consider some of the services in our VoIP infrastructure. Most of you either own, work at, partly own, founded, some type of VoIP operation, because that's why you're here. Um, if you're not, someday you will be there, here for that. Um, but let's look at some of the services we want to consider localizing. And when I say localizing, again, is that we've got this really great protocol, Anycast, that's throwing you know, the shortest routes to all of our endpoints. But in all cases, that's not something that we can use. Um, so if we do, what are some of those services? Signaling, RTP, um, pretty much everybody runs a portal that's going to be filled with CDRs, configuration data, maybe for like hosted PBX or trunking services, and business data, like all the statistics. Um, we also have to consider user sound files in the system, call recording, voicemails. Anybody know of anything else? Pretty much covers it, right? I'm not going to stop doing that. So let's look at signaling. This is actually the most important portion of the, of the setup portion of the call because it starts the transaction. This is our first AnyCast interaction with the endpoint. It's come to us on the closest route. Um, and by spreading the signaling edge with something with BGP and, and AnyCast, we're guaranteeing, again, HA, cleaner routes to the resources, and balancing our network load. It's also going to mitigate something that a lot of us are getting more and more acquainted with, and that's SIP-based attacks. It doesn't stop them necessarily, but at least it spreads the load so that you're not sitting there with your one machine getting annihilated trying to figure out what's going on. And something that's kind of important is that once these routes are kind of put in place, it's not like they should be static. Routing changes on the internet, routers go up, go down. Um, what you want to do is you have this beautiful tool in OpenSIPs. When you're pinging all of your NATed endpoints and sending out that information, you're also going to look at some information that's coming back, which is going to be how good or how qual what the quality of that route was, how fast did I get that packet back, 
And if you see that, if you're measuring it and you see that start to increase, you're going to get a signal that says, hey, I need to maybe consider changing this route. If it's a big customer, if it seems like customers from a certain area. I stole this from Rosmon again, too. Um, this is obviously just, you've seen this in a lot of presentations. This is an open SIPs cluster. The whole idea is that you're going to be using the clustering services on open SIPs to make sure that all the information that you need is at all of your ed endpoints or edge points of open SIPs. And this is what really makes any CAS viable for you. If you didn't have this, sure, you're going all over the place, but all your machines aren't necessarily aware of what's going on on the endpoints, things like that, calls that are running. So we're going to anycast the signaling. Do we really want to necessarily anycast the RTP? Well, in a stateless scenario, it might be OK, meaning that you're not going to be recording that call. Um, you're not necessarily looking to start or stop recording that call. Um, anywhere where resources are, or rather, information is being left behind, if you were using any cast in those types of scenarios, you know that you'd end up with packets all over the place. Um, trying to put them together to form a recorded call would be just insane. Um, but the good thing is, is that we had the signaling portion already occur before we're starting to negotiate the SDP and the RTP here. So why not just trust that? The packet got here, the request got here, the invite got here by any cast. That's probably going to be the shortest route. So let's pick something from the RTP pool that we knowingly, that we know is closest to it, and then just send the traffic through that. It makes sense. Did I skip one? No, I didn't. So what about things like portal access? This is where you're giving all of your customers access to their recordings, you know, to the information that changes their configurations. Um, you're going to have to, at some point or another, be able to globally scale it, yet still keep the resources close to the, cust uh, to the customer. The good thing is, is that, you know, it's not real-time sensitive the way that VoIP is, and you don't need that many pops in one big pool. Um, it's just not that sensitive. You don't have to worry about that. But, you know, all customer data at some point has to be everywhere or everywhere you're going to make available to the customer. It just doesn't necessarily need to be there right away. Um, you definitely want to take all your DB data, your CDRs, all your configuration changes. This stuff needs to be everywhere and be there as fast as possible. So you're going to probably use some type of, um, you know, SQL, non-SQL based, but replicating DB. Um, and storage, you know, you're probably going to want to consider if your network is big enough, you're going to start breaking it down or cutting it up rather into geographic sections. There's no reason if you've got, let's say, five pops in Africa, five pops in the, in the, the EU, five in Asia, and a customer and five in, let's say, California. There's no reason to think that your customers in Africa should under any circumstances, be pulling data from California when it's, if Africa isn't available, Europe is right there ready to go. So you're going to do some static homing uh, of like where your storage groups are going to kind of be. So what's in the storage layer? Basically the call recordings, your user sound files, and your voicemails. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to localize access and how are we going to basically kind of create these groups. Um, seeing that most of it's done via the portal or through some type of an API, the web is your friend. Um, you have really little control over where the files originate. So call recordings, voicemails, and recorded sound files usually done by someone picking up a phone and going through something on the PBX, they're all going to be determined, where they land is going to be determined by that first anycast signaling of the, of, of the invite. Um, that's where the call is, that's where the resources are going to be, that you're going to be interacting with it from a media perspective. Um, so we, in our applications, really like GlusterFS. Um, if you create your storage groups with Gluster, you have all the high availability you need. You have a really fast replication back end. 
again, it's got beautiful tools to be able to create rings of, of storage layers. Um, we didn't see anything else that could do all of this stably and, again, easily. Um, and one of the beautiful things about Gluster is when you actually get into the, the geo-replication portion, um, they have a really unique meshing ability where they elect nodes in each data center to actually be the two communication points. So you're not replicating three nodes to three nodes and have three sets, or rather in that case, six sets of communication going between the DCs. You just have an elected node and it quite nicely handles you know, the deterioration and eventual disabling of that node and electing another node in its place. Now the database information is a little bit different. Um, you need, you've got a lot of tools out there. Uh, we really like for our configuration data um, to be in a MySQL backend, PBXs, PBX applications in the cloud. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of information that you're interacting with and, and from different angles and pivots. So um, we like that MySQL is now um, really well supported in Galera. Before you were kind of stuck to the MariaDB, and although it was really great, um, those of you that love JSON, I'm sure understand that having that support built in and available to you is important, and Maria is kind of trailing MySQL on some of that, we feel. Um, but what about a lot of your stats, like a lot of that quick information that you're pushing to your real-time um, you know, uh, panels in your applications, on the web, in phones, uh, that stuff, we love Redis. Um, Redis with Sentinel basically gives you the ability to have a, a distributed um, storage uh, backend through different nodes in a cluster. Effectively, it will continue to elect your masters. Um, and basically, leave it inside each data center, each location in your pop, in each one of your pops. There's no need to try and, and use any of the stuff that Redis is doing right now to kind of replicate it using that protocol. Um, so in all cases, we really don't like any type of native replication between the pops, but we're fine with it using these tools within the pops. Um, it's just really complex, guys. Who here has been hit by split brain while trying to re redistribute your database? Yeah. Those of you that aren't raising your hands, you're tired, you don't care, and you're lying. <laughs> um, there's a lot of approaches. There's a lot of best practices to that. And there's a lot of tools available within these database, um, within these databases themselves. But in our case, we really like building microservices that are running on top of AMQP. It's very orderly. You make a change in one data center, you update your database, you fire off an event to all the other data, uh, other data centers that necessarily need that information, gives you control of what you're replicating to where. Again, as you're scaling, you need to kind of group um, your, uh, your pops and your rings. Um, so we really love that. And I know that a lot of you are starting to use that as well. It's become super popular. So that's pretty much it. Um, I know that everyone is thinking about big dreams and scaling out all across the world. And although the tools are there for you, keep in consideration how you're going to take care of localizing these resources to your customers. Thank you. Do we have any questions? This gentleman over here. Yeah, let me do my job. Come on. Shit. Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, any questions? No questions. No questions. No one. No yeah. Questions. No. You're oh. really good at what you do. <laughs> <laughs> we got questions. A lot of the problems you talk about, like uh, distributed Galera and storage across nodes, and we have many accounts for self in things like AWS. Is there a reason that you guys are still using self rather than using the existing services in, in Cloudbase? Yes. First of all, I mean, we know that AWS is, is stable. We know that all these tools that already have infrastructure there available for us to grab are stable to a certain degree. You don't control it. 
and we're control freaks. <laughs> Do you have a better answer for that? You, yeah. Shlomi, not you, yeah. Shlomi. I think it's just uh, I think it's just a matter of uh, getting off all of those vendor locks, all of those great uh, public clouds that give you a great land uh, to build whatever you want with uh, three lines of code in the end of the day will uh, give you a very, very big fight with your CFO. And our CFO is not a nice person, so. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is that uh, how to advertise BGP routes uh, using Exa BGP or uh, there is some other way? You, I'm sorry, how to advertise BGP routes? Yeah. Okay, that's done at all of your where you're picking up your, all your network connections. So. The initial advertisement is going to be with them, is it not? Well, your router is actually going to them, but I mean, they're the ones that are controlling it and making sure it's getting out and published. When you're doing BGP, you need to have an AS of your own, an autonomous system. The minimum threshold to getting an autonomous system is a minimum of at least two peers other than yourself that are publishing you. So the database, the RIT database, or whatever. And, database and owning a slash 24. <laughs> Yeah, and owning those IPs so you can have it. So definitely there are some thresholds that needs to be met before you can do that. I think Mike Mavrudis has a question oh, in the back. Yeah. No, it's okay. Let him hit me with it. So so what are some of the challenges you had with any of that? Well because I, you mentioned you mentioned using media and also signaling, right? I mentioned that you're gonna use signaling as your trust point. <laughs> because that's gonna be the, the initial invites coming in from there. So the Anycast decision that's done, getting that invite to you, trust it, and know that that you know, pop is the one that's closest to the customer. If you are gonna use, or you're gonna, uh, if you are gonna do Anycast on, on, uh, on the RTP, then you, it's gotta be completely stateless. You, you can't think you're gonna save something or try to record it. It's just gonna be insane. Otherwise, it's, it's just gonna disappear. Exactly. I don't know, Max, do you think that you could uh, find a way to reassemble packets from about 15 <laughs> RTP proxies? Well, I mean, if, if you... Really? <laughs> <laughs> on an NFS? Come on. Come on, on an NFS level. Max can do anything, come on. This is true. I'm sorry I doubted you. Okay, I think that's it. No more questions. Thank you very much. Oh, wait, okay. Hold on, sorry. Uh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, we got time. We got six minutes. Okay, so say that you've got... Uh, two independent services, just let's say SIP and RTP. Um, if those services needed to become available and unavailable if something goes wrong independently, does that mean you need two 24, two 24s? The right way to do it is a slash 24 per pop. Right. So obviously from a failure perspective, if you've got some type of a service alerting you, you can move the IPs, right? Mm -hmm. But in the case of RTP, I mean, I'm sorry, in the case of, of putting any cast on RTP, I mean. Which is more so the in, in independent. So, say that you've got service A, service B, mm -hmm. and let's say they're advertised in three places New York, London, Hong Kong. Let's say that the RTP goes down in Hong Kong. Yep. Does the RT, RTP, for example, have to be on its own 24? So, the RTP can be not non advertised in Hong Kong, but everything else can continue to be advertised. The SIP can be continued to be advertised. You can use the Unicast from the RTP. Well, that's the whole thing. The RTP wouldn't be anycasted. You'd be replying with a Unicast address. Just, just, just theoretically speaking. Just theoretically service speaking. A, service B, do they have to be 24 to be completely independently brought up and gone down? Pretty much, yes. Yeah. Okay. Now you're in for $10,000. <laughs> My question is that how did you manage with BGP plus cost? Because uh, when we were considering the implementation of the cluster based on the Anycast solution, uh, we've had a problem. Because uh, in case if you uh, allocate the service in terms of geographical position, uh, you have different plus cost towards different data centers. And how to evenly send packets towards each data center if I want to do this, and not to let uh, packets flow go to the closest one. 
So is it possible to solve this in terms of the BGP protocol? Passing it off to the CTO. <laughs> so yeah, generally, if you have only one slash 24, you are in a problem. And that's why generally the best topology will be to advertise probably slash 22, 23 uh, in all of the world for all of the data centers, but make sure that each data center has its own slash 24. That way, as long as the data center is up, you will go into the slash 24. Like any routing protocol, it's very, it's going first for the specific route. And then if this specific route is not up, then you will go to the second data center, and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, the challenging of uh, doing right BGP is- uh, Cost. It's cost. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with a lot of uh, IP addresses, but uh, again, uh, as, uh, Slash 23s, I think, are going for like almost 20K. <coughs> yeah. Slash 22. Slash, I'm sorry, slash 22s are actually going, no, they're going for 16-ish. So as my friend here from the table, Giovanni, was uh, telling me in the last year presentation, if you ask yourself how much cost high availability, you shouldn't. <laughs> That's actually a, a good <laughs> tail end to that. <laughs> you can, you can Do we have any more questions? Because uh, we're out of time. So you have a question? Yeah, I'm just saying. Um, Talk I to your brother say, after. I wanted to say that you're just like high availability. You're priceless, Alex. Thank you. Uh, thank oh. you very much for the show. Thank you. Thank you.